Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. So good morning. Um, my name is Aneta Felix. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, please tell me your full names and I'd like you to spell your full names for me. And please tell me what you do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Felix. My name is Aisha Faith. I am Ugandan based female environmentalist. And I am also the co-founder and team leader at Raw Water Initiative for Climate Action, a community-based nonprofit organization that works with communities to promote access to safe and clean water for people and their animals in marginalized communities. But also we carry out a lot of work, we carry out work in landscape restorations and protecting fragile ecosystems like landslides, deforested uh, land covers, and uh, other uh, fragile ecosystems like buffer zone water catchment areas. So I am also a sociologist and water quality uh, profession. Yeah. Okay, great. Do you mind spelling your the name of your project? Um, I, I just had a raw water or something like that, but I wasn't sure how you spell it. Please. It's raw water, R U R A L, raw water initiative for climate action. Okay, great. Great. All right. You um, can abbreviate it as RICA. I'm sorry? You can abbreviate it as RICA. RICA. R-W-I-C-A. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Can you tell me how bad of an issue plastic pollution is in Uganda? Yeah. So plastic pollution is uh, really one of the growing planetary health crisis that we have in Uganda uh, because you find that actually plastic uh, constitutes or makes up uh, the biggest percentage of uh, non-point source pollution uh, of uh, water bodies, uh, environment spaces, so you find a lot of plastics in our landfills, in our, you know, drainage systems. And right now it's also finding its way into uh, it affecting our human health and animal health. So that this is a growing problem and uh, different efforts are being made to curb this problem, but there's still a lot of need for sensitization and awareness and as well as getting political will from the leaders and decision makers to end this crisis. Yeah. So how's the plastic pollution problem in Uganda really affecting the people there? So plastic pollution in Uganda is really affecting the people in such a way that uh, you find this uh, is a growing challenge and uh, People are affected on a daily with the use of Kavera. Kavera is the polythene bag that uh, you know people use to carry grocery, carry uh, daily, day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, you know, items. But it's uh, everywhere, littering uh, the green spaces, littering the soils and the waters. So you find that this is a major problem. Uh, getting into uh, the water spaces as in terms of um, microplastics, it's finding its way in uh, bloodstreams uh, of, of the people. So we have microplastics affecting human health, and this is a major challenge. The recycling plants are not uh, are big enough to uh, you know, manage complete uh, you know, effective recycling and reuse of plastics. So there is this big challenge that we are facing and one of them is the policies that are not uh, really regulating the mass use of Kavera and, and pollution. Much as there are uh, different uh, initiatives people are trying, especially like uh, sometimes we have the goodwill of the private sector 
uh, we have big multinational companies coming up to, you know, advocate and end uh, plastic pollution, but we still have some producers who are producing Cavera and these are sometimes protected, but it's affecting the, the environment at a large scale and the people, actually mm. people and uh, animals, yeah. Wow. So we see that the government is really leaving much to be desired when it comes to recycling, you know, plastic products in Uganda. So I'm curious to know what your impression is of, you know, citizen led projects like, for instance, the, you know, solar basin by the Ghetto Research Lab. You know, what do you think about projects like that that aim to solve that plastic pollution problem? you know, from their own, you know, you know, using local resources, using, um, you know, women in the community, just finding like community-based solutions to that, you know, global problem. That's great. Um, so I've heard about uh, Ghetto Research Lab and this is one of the social enterprises or community-based solutions that we really are having and uh, creating community-led solutions with the people for real-time problems. So I must commend the good work that the uh, Ghetto Research Lab is doing and uh, the different innovations that are coming up, like the solar benzene, is something that can really go a long way to... Uh, show practical interventions on ending uh, the planetary crises like uh, plastic pollution that we are having. So uh, if uh, the, the, the solar benzene is uh, really going to come up and I'm positive, it's going to create solutions that we are looking for because uh, one, it's uh, we are having efficient energy use and a clean energy so also the fact that we are able to recycle the water from the you know the laundry that the benzene is uh, that the end user will have maybe use that too because one we are conserving water from excessive use and then the water that is used we can also reuse it for maybe irrigation but also the fact that we are using solar to you know do laundry then we are reducing on mass energy consumption, but at the same time using clean energy. So I'm very positive that the Ghetto Research Lab is coming up with a very needed intervention that can create awareness, but also shock practical interventions and solutions to plastic pollution and other elements that are really affecting our climate. Hmm. Yes, it, it does seem like really good work. But when you consider the context of this problem, you know, the WHO um, estimates that there are over 400 million tons of plastic produced globally every year. And that's just about 10% of, you know, the global plastic products in the world, you know, gets recycled. And then there's this great organization in Uganda trying to solve the problem. But when you look at it in the scale of, you know, just how big of an issue this is globally, do you feel like the lab is getting any traction? Do you feel like their work is making any impact at all? Yes. So indeed, uh, that's a good question, given the contextual background and uh, the global situation in terms of pollution, plastic, as a case uh, scenario. So I believe that the Ghetto Research Lab and what their solution and what the solution is, there is a contribution. I must say there is a big contribution towards uh, ending plastic pollution, towards creating awareness, towards bringing different stakeholders uh, to look at the problem and what solutions can be done to end the problem. So I believe this is a contribution and it's going to really uh, impact on the lives of the people and the environment. Hmm. 
Okay, but on the flip side, um, do you see any potential drawbacks, you know, or any, maybe any unintended consequences, for instance, that's associated with the use of recycled plastic in this manner? Sorry, can you say that again? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to find out if there's like any potential consequences for recycling plastic like this? Uh, well, the consequence would be, uh, you know, um, still the existence of plastic because if people are going to produce it and cons and constantly say they're going to recycle it, then we shall have more and more plastics produced. But the rate at which it's being recycled, we cannot track that and monitoring it is another expensive uh, process. So if we can really uh, mitigate, you know, or reduce as much as we can on plastic production and find other ways of you know packaging and you know things like this sustainably then that can be uh you know a change that we can want to see but so we can, if continuously you're producing plastic and saying we're going to recycle it the rate of recycling may be much more lower than the rate of producing plastic yeah mm, interesting and um Yes, you just talked about how there's the challenge of lawmaking from the national level. Um, so for a project like this, how do you see it fitting into like the la larger national um, and, and maybe even global waste management strategies? You know, like what's the place of this? Is there like a possibility of a project like this, for instance, being adopted like on a national level? you know, where like the government could partner with organizations like this and make recycling a big deal in Africa and maybe working to cut down the production. I mean, even even though like Africa would contribute to, I mean, just about, about less than 4% to the global plastic production, you know, but we still have a responsibility, you know, because we consume plastic as well, even though that's still seem to be low on the grand scheme of things where we're like 5% for like, um, you know, plastic um, consumption, basically like globally, like lots of many other countries, especially like Asian countries, you know, really tops Africa in terms of like global plastic production and consumption and things like that. But we still do have that challenge because dumping is a big problem, you know? So I'm, I'm just wondering what you feel, because like, there's lots of innovative solutions produced in Africa. Like we're very creative people, amazing work that we're doing. I mean, the work by the Ghetto Research Lab, I was really astounded when I found, found, found it, you know. But the question is, are government agencies and people that are responsible for scaling these kind of projects, are they listening? Are they hearing? If they are listening and hearing in the first place, are they willing to integrate this into like the national policy to make this, you know, big enough such that it's able it's able to make an impact. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's 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 taken mm. from just a local organization doing something small in their own corner, so that it's able to have like a ripple effect across the country. It becomes something that other African countries can you know benefit from. It becomes like this big wider African you know, initiative it becomes like an African solution to an to a global problem, in fact. I, I don't know if you understand where I'm coming mm. from. Like, how mm. do you see um government organizations taking local homegrown solutions like this and scaling this, you know, for the greater good and you know, taking this beyond a small local project in Kampala to a you know a big national Ugandan solution or an African solution, you know? Mm. Well, that is a very good question because it triggers the interests of our key stakeholders 
uh, towards appreciating the problem and uh, you know having a collective responsibility towards ending it. So how I see our government coming into our supports uh, these uh, local aid solutions is um, I think through uh, communications like these, through awareness of platforms like these that we need to constantly uh, make, you know, government allocate, you know, uh, certain uh, budgets and funding towards uh, this kind of initiatives, towards, uh, you know, maybe youth-led social enterprises, because, you know, this is the future of, of, of our continent, of our planet, if we are to involve, you know, young people in this kind of uh, solutions and encourage them because they have identified the problem, they are coming up with a solution. We need the goodwill of now policymakers and politicians to come up and you know support this kind of initiative. But sometimes you find that there are budget cuts to uh, this kind, you know, maybe the concerned line ministries, they're not giving them this kind of attention that they need. But on the other hand, there are also uh, other interventions that uh, development partners are doing to support these uh, kind of initiatives, and even the government supports at some. I know at, a, at some point, for example, uh, we have the last week we had the Kampala Innovation Week, and we had different entrepreneurs coming up to uh, you know speak towards different uh, kind of solutions that are finding and contributing to. So these kind of spaces like Kampala Innovation Week. Uh, you know, we have Start Hub uh, Africa that is, you know, supporting and giving spaces to social entrepreneurs. We have Social Innovation Academy in MPG. They are really supporting our uh, entrepreneurs. So they work hand in hand with, uh, you know, with uh, policymakers, with line ministries. And it's at this point that we can bring in uh, these kind of solutions and encourage the policymakers to support these solutions to keep standing and not dissolve in the array of so many other things that are taking place. But one thing is that the government needs to stop protecting polluters and rather protect uh, conservationists or those that are doing something to end you know, plastic pollution. For example, Kampala has uh, one of the worst air qualities according uh, to WHO. And so if we can, and you know, one of the contributors is of course, can plastic pollution, industrial effluents, and you know, things like this, and you know, produ producing plastic. So if we can really support the end of this kind of records of you know, air pollution, plastic pollution, then we can have the government supporting us because we have these in our national development plans, but the implementation and reinforcing of, of, of this kind of, uh, solutions is what we need yeah yeah ex thank you so much um for your response and this really leads me to a very important question which is does it feel like the government really cares about solving these problems right because in many parts of the world you want to assume that if this is a global challenge especially one that's so affecting the african continent and there are people who are so passionate about the environment as to come up with creative solutions to the problems. The government should be knocking on their doorstep, seeking collaboration. How do we adopt and scale this? But you have situations, you know, that's happened time and time again where people are coming up with genius ideas and solutions. And it feels like they keep tagging the government. I mean, and nothing's happening. I mean, for instance, just a few weeks ago, we did a story about like, amazing kids from all across Africa who, you know, created mind-blowing apps, things that would help the government in different aspects, politics, you know, you name it. And you have situations where it's us, the journalists and the innovators of this project that are tagging the government officials to say, look at this thing, it's, it's gonna help the country, like adopt this, scale this, you know, work with us. When it should be the other way around, you know, the, the citizens are coming up with ideas. They're willing to, they're willing to help. But the government officials. That's why I started my question asking: Is the government seeing this? So I guess my final question to wrap would be: 
what do you feel are some of the challenges, the stumbling blocks that are standing between the government um, basically adopting these innovative solutions by citizens? Would you say this is just sheer corruption? This is, you know, something very important you mentioned. You're like, they need to focus on, you know, the environmental solutions, you know, rather than protecting the people who are actually causing the climate crisis in the first place. So is this a money issue? Like the government really just cares about the corporation and the profits that they bring them rather than the global environmental good. So would you say it's it's profits over people? And how mm-hmm. can we fix yes. that? You know, do we do we all need to keep tagging the government? What do we do about it? Mm-hmm. Well, this is amazing, and I'm great that we're having this talk uh, because it is uh, these kind of discussions that can help us, propel us to, you know, greater heights in terms of the solutions that we want to see at the local level, at the global level, starting at the local, you know, action. So I think one of the bottlenecks that we have is corrupt corruption you know yes we need to talk about corruption and we need to talk about uh you know the people who are benefiting in you know polluting the environment at the expense of the larger good at the expense of the well-being of the environment and the people and you know the future generations because if it's a few handful of people who are benefiting from commerce and industry of polluting the environment but they're not looking at the long-term uh, impacts, then you're going to have a very big challenge in future and reversing the effects of these challenges are going to be much more expensive than what we can do right now to end pollution. Yeah, so I, I really agree with you. I hear you. And that uh, when we have, uh, you know, innovators, you know, especially young people who are coming up with these brilliant ideas, they need to be uh, supported they need to be seen and heard. So we need to uh, amplify voice and accountability for uh, solutions that are, uh, you know, sharing um, a platform to mitigate and, and end this kind of planetary crises. So in Africa, we need to agree that uh, we are contributing to the global good and we need to have a collective responsibility towards ending uh, these climate challenges. So our government, I would really uh, implore them to not only put this in our executive orders and, and in writing, but also reinforce uh, reinforce the, the policies or the laws that they're saying should be working to protect the environment, not just write about it, but also regulate regulate and reinforce the implementation of ending plastic pollution. Thank you so much, Aisha. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'd like you to um, kindly spell your full names for me to make sure that we're getting that correctly. Thank you. Yes. A-I-S-H-A, Aisha. And Faith, F A I. T H faith, then Nankanja is N A N K A N J A. Aisha Faith Nankanja. Okay, if we're to only take two names, um, which is your first and your last name, please? Uh Aisha Faith. Faith is my adopted name, but uh that's my name, Aisha Faith. Okay, Aisha Faith. Okay. All right. I um, really appreciate speaking with you. Um, thank you so much. And um, just give me your preferred title. Um, would it be environmentalist? Would it be climate expert? Um, what two words um, would be best to describe your work, please? An environmentalist. Okay, great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed speaking with you. Yes, let's keep these conversations um, going on social media and, and the rest. And yes, I would keep in touch. For our, our video today, this morning. I'm sorry?
Mm. Okay, so <laughs> could I please take a picture of our uh, video? Oh, sure, sure. My phone? Can, yeah, you can take a screenshot. Yeah, um, you can stop the recording and just forward it to me on WhatsApp, please. Like, if you could, if you could send it as soon as possible, that would be great. Thank you very much, Felix. Yeah. Felix, it's been a great Yeah, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.